And we're recording. Welcome to the CPSC webinar for February 27, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Today's topic is practical cybersecurity for open science projects. And the, our hosts are our very own, uh, CTSC's very own, Craig Jackson, Susan Sons, and Bob Cowell. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Before we begin, I have a few items I'd like to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect session, which you've already discovered. And we accept uh, questions at the end of the presentation as well. And having said that, I will hand the microphone over to Craig and Susan. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Can you hear us? All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, so, the, yeah, the topic for today is practical cybersecurity for open science projects. I'm Craig Jackson. You'll be hearing from myself and Susan and Bob as we move through these slides. Um, and I'm going to be in charge of just kicking us off with some introductory notes. Um, if you're not familiar with CTSC or, or need a reminder, um, and, and this will be relevant as we make our way through the webinar today, just want to remind folks of CTSC's mission. Um, CTSC, uh, now the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, um, has this mission, to provide the NSF, the NSF community a coherent understanding of cybersecurity's role in producing trustworthy science and the information and know-how required to achieve and maintain effective cybersecurity programs. Quick outline of what we're going to cover today. Uh, a little bit more intro stuff, uh, and particularly focusing on our audience and the goals for this particular session. Um, then Susan Sons is going to talk about cybersecurity and its relationship to science. Um, Susan and I will talk a little bit more about this concept of a cybersecurity program, and then Bob Coles will get to um, a very practical to-do list of must-dos for science projects when it comes to security and privacy. Okay, so some intro notes. Um, one is, is it's important to, to note the, the audience for today's session. CTSC's work uh, spans the full range of NSF-funded projects and facilities. And that includes uh, very, very large investments in, in uh, scientific discovery, and it includes uh, uh, very small awards, uh, at least small in terms of, of, of uh, money and resources allocated. And we, we're, our mission covers uh, that full range. Uh, so today we're really focused on smaller science projects, and what do we mean by smaller? Um, smaller for us from a cybersecurity point of view means that you're unlikely to have dedicated security personnel or a dedicated security budget in your research uh, funding. Um, you're unlikely to need a lot of policy and process that's really specific to your work. Um, but you are still undoubtedly working with valuable uh, and or sometimes sensitive data and IT infrastructure. At very least, um, um, your, the, this, uh, this infrastructure and this data is important to you, it's important to your institution, and, uh, okay, I'm getting a note about my, uh, about my volume, sorry about that. Um, but, okay, so, this third bullet is, you, you know, your work is still valuable to you and your institution, and potentially, you know, the, the, the impacts of, of any science project are, are broader than we can really imagine at the outset. And then finally, um, in the context of smaller science projects, uh, our experience is that relationships, for instance, with um, your host institution are particularly important when it comes to cybersecurity. So, 
our hypothetical audience member is uh, who we've really imagined as the, the, the uh, prototypical audience member for this session um, is something like a clueful principal investigator who's thinking, hmm, do I need to worry about this cyber stuff? Um, and, and that's not to say, we've kind of geared the, the slides and the material uh, in that direction. That's not to say that this session would be uh, irrelevant to others. Many of the folks that we interact with on a regular basis um, at the NSF CCOE are people who uh, do a great deal to support or enable uh, scientific work to get done, whether it's through uh, dedicated research facilities, institutions, compute centers, or, or otherwise. Okay, so uh, quickly some goals for today's session. Uh, we want to provide that hypothetical concerned researcher with A, uh, a sense of cybersecurity's relevance to science, B, a sense of cybersecurity's complexity and scope, Three, a sense of how a cybersecurity program can help you uh, cope with that complexity and protect your science project. Four, a few very doable must-do items um, that, that any science project, any PI, any researcher can, can undertake. And then finally, get your questions on the table. I, I think that we almost certainly will have time uh, for questions toward the end or throughout. A couple of uh, caveats. One, the, the views uh, that Susan, Bob, and I are expressing today are our own. They're not intended to uh, represent the NSF or our institutions. And, you know, if we use terms like, for instance, sensitive information that have some specific operational meaning at, at your institution or your place of work, uh, just know that we're, we're using uh, these terms in a general sense. Uh, finally, uh, we use the terms information security or info infosec and cybersecurity basically interchangeably. Um, so don't be confused by that. We're really not meaning to, uh, to switch uh, meanings or domains. And if, if uh, we, we, we do fall into the trap of using a lot of jargon, so uh, feel, don't feel embarrassed and feel free to ask for clarification on any points. Okay, intro out of the way. I'll turn it over to Susan. Cybersecurity and science. So what this comes down to is the IT world is stormy. There are always things happening. Um, but what does this mean for science? Um, the 30 meter telescope, their website got hacked. There were attacks on other telescopes. Um, we have ransomware. We have uh, Science needs to be trustworthy and reproducible. In the end, you're doing science. If you can't say what happened to your data between the time you collected it and the time that you present conclusions to someone, you haven't really done science. Um, one of the things that we require is that we can reproduce the process. Um, another thing that we require is that we know that the data is what we say the data is, that it hasn't been tampered with in the meantime. Um, Additionally, there are a lot of scientists who worry about release of data prematurely if they're chasing a publication and they want to get something out before competitors, or if they're concerned about data that's sensitive because they're working with health information, or they're working with information on endangered species, or they're working with politically sensitive information. Um, all of these things are targets. And additionally, there are a lot of people who say, well, I don't handle sensitive data. Um, a lot of people think security means confidentiality. Can I keep this secret? But in science, we're usually far more worried about integrity. Can I prove that my data is what it says it is and it has not been tampered with? Can I prove that my data doesn't have mistakes in it that were introduced along the way? That's data integrity. Um, and also availability. You don't want to put four years of work into a research project to have everything you have wiped out by a vulnerability in your server. Um, your, your work can just go away that way. Um, 
Confidentiality before going public with big news can be a thing, but again, most of what we do is open, and that makes what we do a little bit different than what you see in a lot of corporate America. Um, we have valuable data, and we do have some pretty powerful IT. Um, you know, I had a scientist say to me, well, I do kelp research. Who cares about my kelp research? They're never going to attack me. I said, yes, and because you believe that, it's a lot easier to break into your stuff and steal your password to the supercomputer instead of just breaking into the supercomputer. Because you have access to very valuable resources where people, you know, might want to mine Bitcoin or something. Um, and once you have an IP, you're a target. Um, there's what my colleagues and I call internet noise. There are scanners that just go across everything connected to the internet to see if they can find something vulnerable. Because even if they're not after what you have, using what you have as a jumping off point to attack other machines is itself valuable. Um, there's also the issue of ransomware, which I'll talk about again in a moment. And, you know, open science, we want it to be open, but that also means that we're easy to find. Um, you know, a lot of our threats are not the evil criminal who are after us. Um, a lot of the times it's just the things existing in our environment, the viruses wandering around and the fact that we aren't often rigorous in how we manage our technology. So ransomware. The issue that my data isn't valuable to anyone except me. And ransomware is an infection that can come in and lock up everything that you own and you pay off the authors or they don't unlock it for you. And this is becoming an increasing problem for research scientists because your entire grant is gone if all your data is gone. And where are you going, where's the line item in your budget that pays ransom? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Um, and there are mitigations that can make you immune to this, but most people don't know about them. And that's something that we really want to help bring to people. Um, th this is as much scare tactic, scare talk as you're going to get from us. We're not here to scare you, but we want to understand. Um, a lot of people think security is, let's make something impossible to break into. Well, that pretty much means that I crush your computer into tiny pieces, encase the pieces in cement, and drop them to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. I have made your computer perfectly secure. I've also made it completely unusable. That's not what we want. We want security that enables science, that makes you better at doing your job, that makes your job easier to do. And so what we want is things that fit the scientific mission. So before you say, isn't this just an IT problem, I hate to break it to you, but despite what some of the less competent vendors will tell you, you cannot buy a box and plug it in and switch it on, and that is your information security. There is no magic box. Information security is how you deal with your information and your technology and how you protect it. Um, it's equally broken if we steal paper with sensitive information on it, or if a mistake nukes your entire research database, or if you're compromised by a network-based attack. It doesn't really matter how it went wrong if it goes wrong. Um, information security has a positive impact on science, even for smaller projects. I like to say it's the science of protecting science. So on to cybersecurity programs, what we're actually trying to do here. Yeah, so we, we, we keep mentioning this concept of cybersecurity program, and we, we found that it's actually helpful to, to talk about what we mean by that specifically. A uh, cybersecurity program, it's not a plan. Um, it's not a single project with a, with a clear uh, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, this is our definition. A cybersecurity program is a structured approach to develop, implement, and maintain an environment conducive to appropriate levels of information security and risk to the organization's mission, i.e. your science mission. Cybersecurity programs are made up of ongoing activities and projects in a, a number of areas that I won't read to you. And cybersecurity programs should be scoped to the key assets, resources, and lifespan of organizations. Okay, so bottom line, Cybersecurity programs, and we think these are a good thing, are living, breathing things. They're programmatic elements of getting your work done over time. 
So what would a, a PI or project manager really want out of having a cybersecurity program? Well, the, the program enables science impact, trust, and productivity by, one, ensuring the availability of key information systems and processes critical to getting your science done. Two, guaranteeing the integrity of the data from accidental or malicious modification or destruction or locking up and throwing into the <laughs> into a trench. Uh, three, protecting the confidentiality of private or sensitive information from accidental or malicious disclosure when you've got that uh, that you're dealing with. And four, and this one's really important, obtaining these results while minim minimizing inconveniences and costs of the program. We are not the folks, uh, CTSC are not the security folks who are gonna show up and say, no, you can't get your work done. Uh, there has to be a balance. We like science. It's why we're here. <laughs> so, Susan, what what are the so one thing we promote is really thinking about security from from day zero, from day one, from the get go. What are what are the advantages to that for someone who's just received a, a, a modest reward? So you can retrofit security, but don't do it unless you have to. Because if you are building it in from day one, you're going to get the most bang for your buck. It's more effective and less expensive because retrofitting takes a lot more labor and you end up replacing things you already paid for. Um, you get to make security consideration of the equipment, software, and service purchases you do from the beginning, which means that you're not buying something that's insecure and then trying to buy something else to secure it with which makes you spend considerably more money, plus you're spending a lot more labor because you're configuring around things that are already broken. Um, additionally, you get to get your data storage and transport right. Um, you don't have to try to look for things. Searching your own network and all your own computers to try to get a hold of all the data you're trying to protect when you don't know where it is anymore is a nightmare. And it means that you have IT people who spend all their time interrupting and interrogating your scientists which is really what makes scientists love them, let me tell you. Um, that, that's a low conflict workplace. And most of all, you get to avoid disturbing scientists' workflows in the course of retrofitting security me measures after tech is in place. As, in, as a security expert, I don't want to go to a scientist and say, hey, I have to take down all of your sensor nodes for the next week so that I can retrofit security because the person who built it did it wrong. I'd much rather ha go in before something is built and say, hey, here's three things you need to know when you're setting these up and have the person constructing it say, thanks, I'm putting that in my checklist and have it go right and not have to stop scientists from doing their work. Um, there's lots of information on this. We built a guide that has a lot of instructions and it has a lot of templates so that you can get the policies and procedures together. You will not need all of the templates. Please don't look at the stack and get scared. We tried to have everything there so that you can pick and choose the ones that are applicable to you. We also have a group of email lists if you'd like to get somewhat infrequent updates on things that may matter to science projects and their cybersecurity. There are more webinars like this one coming up. We have a library of useful links and other training materials available, so please make use of them. These are all free resources. Well, not free. NSF already paid for them so that they would be free to you and not come out of your budget. Yeah, and I'll just emphasize here, uh, you know, this is not a comprehensive list of, of all the different activities and, and resources that uh, we offer. And I, I think really those email lists, particularly since they're not you know, it, we're not talking a, about a ton of traffic. Mm -hmm. Those are a great way to to get uh, initially familiarized with what we're doing, what we have to offer. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, so um, moving on to section four and Bob Coles with with sort of your your checklist of must dos. Okay, so. There are a number of things that you need to do to to make sure that you're adequately covered in terms of cybersecurity. Um, the first step here, we're going to go through these in, in much more detail. Of course, you have to determine what you have. These four things that are listed under here are probably going to be something that you kind of do in parallel or at least iterate on because you're going to discover as you go through these things 
you're going to have to go back and say, oops, oh, okay, I forgot about this. Um, once you know what you have, you're going to want to know, okay, what is it that my institution already provides? So you, there's no need to duplicate that. Uh, determine who is responsible for the various controls, fill in any gaps that you need, and, and then there are a bunch of things that, of course, uh, have to be covered, and we'll go through those. Uh, so inventorying the assets. Uh, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no way to secure what you can identify and find. Um, you need to have uh, or be aware of what kind of asset type it is, where it is, how would you identify this in terms of, you know, it's, it's a good to have the, the, the records about what version it is. Uh, what kind of protection do you think this uh, needs to have? And who to contact if something go, should go wrong with this? There is a template on the, uh, on the website that uh, Susan referenced before that, that allows you to just sort of like fill in the blanks on the various assets as you find them. Um, identifying the stakeholders. So there are lots of people that are potentially interested or relevant to your, to your project. There's a project leadership. You need to make sure that they are involved and understand that cybersecurity is important. Uh, the institution that you that you're in, embedded in may have certain requirements, and they may also provide resources. For instance, having their own cybersecurity team that you need to interact with. Um, there are potentially data subjects and research participants. You may have obligations for in terms of. Uh, protecting certain data. Um, funding agency may have some requirements. They may also have some resources that you can use. And information system owners. Now, the, this this can be very tricky because at some level, you know, you may dis decide, okay, this is whoever is 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 taking care of the system, uh, the particular system, the sysadmin. Uh, but it also may be at a higher level who is sort of like responsible for the process and able to make decisions about accepting residual risk. Is it is it okay if we leave this port open uh, because even though there are some threats out there, this is really important to the way the science progresses. So. So it's very important to identify these uh, these system owners. And it's not just a, a sort of a technical system owner. We'll get to a little more detail on that. And then we need to categorize, or in other words, classify the data. And I, I use the word categorize because I was af af afraid of saying classify, um, because it's not classification in the uh, in the uh, DoD sense. But you need to develop some sort of scheme that 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 puts the data in several different categories, probably no more than three or four. And this is based upon how d critical the data is to the project and any compliance requirements that you might have. Um, of course, availability and integrity are very important issues. And, and you need to specify what rules apply to different categories of data in terms of uh, how they're transported across the network, whether or not they need to be encrypted, and where they are, where they reside, are stored, and where they are processed in terms of what kind of, of controls you need to have in place uh, for that. And then you need to determine these information flows, how information flows around your project. And this will help you determine what uh, what critical systems you have? You know, there's the old story about the the for the one of the nail, the kingdom was lost because uh, it needed to fix the horse the horseshoe of the horse that that uh, where the the rider was going to go warn the people the, about the impending invasion. Um, so this helps you find those critical assets that you might not realize that some innocuous piece of, uh, of equipment over sitting over there in the corner is actually critical to your uh, to your science 
and that it deserves uh, maybe more protection and attention that you were uh, that you were giving it. So you need to map out where your data comes from, where it goes, and where it's stored, and so then these various information processes within your within your project uh, need to have owners assigned to them. Uh, these are the people that can decide. Okay, uh, what is what is an acceptable risk for this process? Uh, how much do I need to? Uh, how many? What kind of level of controls do I need to have? You know, by default, the owner is project management. If uh, if nobody else can be identified, so as I said, these four things. As you go through them, you're going to go probably go back and uh, and and revise some of the things you're going to discover in the process of doing the information flows. Oh, I forgot about this asset. I need to add that asset. Uh, oh, I need to I need to find uh, uh, somebody who's an information system owner. Uh, things like that. So this is a very iterative process. Um, once you've done that, and you know you don't ha it doesn't have to be exhaustive. So you can just go through and sort of map out. You want to you want to at least map out the critical processes for your for your particular project. But then figure out what the institution provides. The institution will have lots of policies already in place. You know, probably an acceptable use policy, incident response policy, all sorts of things. So you need to look at and, and communicate with the uh, uh, the institution cybersecurity team to see what they already have and what existing uh, procedures uh, there are to, uh, to to deal with these so don't 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 duplicate what already exists um, there is uh, lots of operational support that the cyber institutional cybersecurity team may have for you or you know or they may just say hey no we're too busy with you know students or we're too busy with other things uh, you've got to provide these on your own so so find out what is available and uh, and try to leverage those as much as possible don't duplicate what you don't have to and then fill in the gaps as it says, a little bit of spackle might be all that is required. So there are lots of community resources. Don't forget that there, you know, don't don't forget the use of of, of Google or or whatever uh, scientific uh, uh, conferences you attend. Find out what other people are doing, what uh, what resources might be available, and uh, and make use of those. Um, other service providers can provide can help provide some security. Uh, lots of cloud, you know, depending on what sort of cloud system you use and what services you contract for, uh, they have a lot more resources in terms of potentially investigating or protecting um, you know, protecting data or systems than uh, than you can provide. And then define your own modest cybersecurity program in terms of what are the additional policies that you need just for your project, and what are the basic controls uh, that need to be available. So there are certain areas here that need to be covered, and you have to make sure that they are covered either at the institutional level or for your project. Of course, in authentication and access controls, you've got to be able to have like user IDs and some sort of authentication, whether you provide that for your project or use some sort of uh, existing uh, thing at the at the uh, at the institutional level, and decide who has and you have to decide who has access to what sorts of data. Um, you've got to have configuration and vulnerability management. How are the systems going to be configured? What are the ways that they need to be fig configured for security, and who's going to make sure that they're patched and do appropriate scanning to make sure that the patches stick? Um, monitoring, 
there's uh, you have to be able to generate logs and monitor network activity so that you know if something is actually going wrong and where it where it went wrong. Handling uh, handling the uh, the thing that went wrong, incident response and remediation. How do you figure out how do you, how do you first of all the monitoring is for de detecting something that went wrong, and then the incident response is to recover and uh, and patch whatever uh, whatever went wrong. Uh, you need to make sure that you have backups and that you have appropriate retention for those backups. Uh, it's really important not just to have backups, but also to test to make sure that they actually work when you. Uh, when you actually need to use a backup, that's not the time to run around and figure out how it is that you actually do uh, do a data restore. Um, for one thing, a lot of times the, you have to be very careful because the processes for uh, or the procedures for uh, recovering, also in the terms of incident response, uh, maybe have been stored online. Uh, and are now unavailable. So make sure you have some sort of uh, offline copies of how to deal with incidents and, and how to do uh, uh, data restoration. And then, of course, you need to, these, these whatever policies and procedures that you have put in place, you need to make sure that uh, everybody knows what they are and that people are aware of the threats that, that we have talked about today, that they're not just saying, okay, we don't need to worry about cybersecurity. There are some problems here, and uh, we need to be careful. We need to be careful about clicking on links and, uh, and that sort of thing. So the user training and awareness is very important. Um, so are there any questions? If not, we have... Some other slides to go into more detail on those uh, on those areas, but uh, we're happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, I just second that. We really wanted to provide a pretty high level overview, and and would be much more excited to to field questions than to just start digging into to more technical details. I see some people typing. Adam says, is anyone using the NCommon framework for identity access management? Bob, I, of the folks on this call, you may be the best position to, to answer that question. Okay, I'm not sure that the NCommon framework uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. There is a uh, that may be a little <clears throat> that may be a little heavyweight for what you actually need in the in the project. I would say for access management, typically you can in this you know in the smaller projects, you probably ought to be paying more attention to whatever is available at your institution. Jim Basney just joined us as a presenter. That's like his bread and butter. Why don't we let him Jim jump in? Yeah, I just uh, promoted him, so maybe if he's able, if he's near a microphone, he can say something. Oh, he's typing. Okay. Um, while Jim is responding. I just want to go over a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, we have a survey that I'd like to post here in the chat. Uh, so please take a moment to fill that out. Uh, Jim, are you are you on? Nope, not yeah, yet. Yeah, he okay. just answered the chat. I don't think he has a mic. Yeah. And then so, I wanted to go ahead and sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that that Jim says that 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 for institutions that have the in common framework, 
they generally use that for authentication, and, but you still have to do your own access control in terms of who has, once they've authenticated, what is it that they do have access to. Okay, and now we have another question for Solyndra, uh, from Solyndra, sorry. What security measures uh, can I take other than the institutional ones to protect my data flow from my computers to local data storage? So encrypt, without knowing which local type of local data storage you're looking at, um, find out what encryption is available point to point because anything that travels over a network, even a local network unencrypted, is vulnerable because anything else on that network um, now at least has the ability to observe it and may be able to manipulate it. Um, apart from that, look at how you're storing it because data at rest has a much longer window for tampering than data in transit. Um, and if it's just sitting there on a server and it's not encrypted on the server or the server's not getting regular updates and things like that, um, that is a situation where it's kind of a sitting duck for when someone wanders by. And that's a much bigger window than just when you're communicating. Um, so look at how, you're, how your computer's talking to the server and look at what's happening at rest. Let's see, I'm using QNAP Nets. Okay, um, let me look those up real quick. And Solyndra, um, if we do get more questions uh, in here, we can uh, certainly, uh, if you if you email us, uh, mm -hmm. we can we can get back to you. Yep. If you like, go ahead and drop me an email because I'm going to have to look up. That's somebody's proprietary box, and I'm going to look up what they have available. Cool. So. She says, "Sure, not a problem." So uh, Susan Miller says, can you say more about ransomware? I could say a couple of things more about it that, <laughs> that have jumped out at me. Um, the, as Susan mentioned, uh, one of the scary things about ransomware is that it really puts an emphasis on you know, your own systems and your own data's value, value to you. And right. so the, the, for, for the people trying to extract money um, uh, uh, out of victims, a whole lot more uh, individuals and organizations are tempting targets here. Okay, right. So, um, for instance, I think it was last week, um, a public library in St. Louis uh, mm -hmm. faced a major ransomware attack. Fortunately, they had controls enough in place, they were able to avoid paying the ransom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a recent New York Times article emphasizing uh, the the number of small uh, businesses mm -hmm. that are uh, finding themselves victim of ransomware. Um, Susan, can you can you speak a little bit to the various ways that you can end up being infected with ransomware? Ransomware can come in pretty much the same way any form of malware can. It can get passed to you from media that comes in. A, a CD, a DVD, a USB stick. Um, it can come in on an email. It can come in on a PDF document. Um, it can come in on a Microsoft Office document. Um, any of these things can have executable parts. It can come in when you visit a website that has flash components. Um, it can come in from an advertisement on a website. Um, all of these things are things that you're going to come in contact with every day. Um, I, I was at a security conference last fall and one of my favorite smart aleck security guys held up a big sign that said, stop blaming the victim. There's someone who in HR whose job it is to open PDFs from unknown people every day because they yeah. might be resumes. Stop blaming the victim and give them protections against this stuff. Um, and that's something that we work to do. And the biggest protection against ransomware is having good backups, making sure the backups get checked by a human regularly, and making sure that there is something in between the machine and the backup so that the machine can't immediately go and nuke the backups. Because having your machine be able to write to the backup 
and having the machine be able to destroy last week's backup are two different things. And that's where a lot of people run into trouble because ransomware is getting pretty smart and it will infect your machine, just figure out which of the common methods of backup you use, destroy it, and then encrypt your machine. And that's something a lot of people are facing. So having good quality backups and having a buffer between individual machines destroying those backups so that when you get hit by ransomware, because unless you run an extremely locked down system that we don't see very often in scientific settings. Or anywhere. <clears throat> Except for Susan's laptop. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you have a high likelihood of getting hit at some point. What I like to do is go, oh, wow, my backups are so good. I'm just going to erase this and start over and not pay off the people who did this to me because I don't want to reward them for their behavior So or empty my bank account. <laughs> and let me just put in a kind of wild plug for application whitelisting. Yes. I, I know this is a control that when you look at the really good uh, short lists of security controls, like the critical security controls, the, the work that uh, the Australian government is doing, uh, the NSA IAD top 10, mm -hmm. they all feature prominently application whitelisting to keep bad applications, unwelcome applications, wandering around applications from, from running on your systems. Not, uh, not a, it's, a, it's a challenge for places to implement. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, it's just something that people need to be considering. For those of you who aren't familiar with application waitlisting, what it means is that some person, usually your IT person who knows your office well and what you should and shouldn't be running, makes a list of every possible program your computer should be allowed to run. If your computer sees something that is not on that list, it refuses to run it. That is good because when a virus shows up, your computer goes, wait a minute, uh, you're not on the list. I won't run you. The bad news is when you want to run a new program, you have to go to your IT person and ask them to put it on the list. So you have a little bit of a delay built in there. That delay is really worth it when your computer refuses to run all the new viruses it sees. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to know it's a virus. It just has to know it's not on the list. So we probably more than answered that question. I hope, I hope we answered that question. Um, we like to talk about ransomware. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very real concern uh, right now. Um, there's a question from Grace. Um, based on the nature and variance of security exploits in the wild, how does one assist one's scientific community to classify, classify the research data slash scientific workflow slash processes and to different categories of sensitivity, such as classified, sensitive, et cetera. Um, uh, Grace, a couple of thoughts. One, um, at trustedci.org slash guide, there's an information classification uh, template. And it, uh, and it probably would be familiar to you just in the sense of it's just a few categories, um, and there's some descriptive language there uh, that could could uh, could give you a sense of of the range of sensitivity that we're uh, that that might be helpful for you. Um, I think uh, what is important about that range of classifications is that you know is not that the the words sound important, but that they describe. Uh, data that real and information that really need different levels of care, different types of attention, mm -hmm. right? So you you want to have uh, data classification or system classification that um, that you and the people you work with can meaningfully translate into action. And I tend to think of it in terms of not trying to understand all the bad things that are out there, but here's this thing I have. What don't I want to happen to it? Um, you know, here's a machine. I don't want it to get broken into because. I don't want it to get broken into because it has personal information on it, or I don't want it get to get broken into because it controls a really expensive instrument that somebody can break. If you can say, I don't want this broken into or abused because, and you can finish that sentence, you can figure out data classification. Yeah, I think that's really important because it's really not a function of the threats 
that are out there. It's a, it's, it's a function of how important is this data or this system to the project? What happens if it just disappears? How critical is that? Yeah, absolutely. Bob, there's a question from Michael Zimmer. Um, maybe you can feel that one since Susan and I have been talking so much. Can you speak to the idea of not doing email or web browsing on a workstation where project work occurs? Either separate physical systems for separate uses or a, vir or a virtual machine approach. Is this feasible or venture into too much security not easy to use? Uh, I think this is a, an excellent question. I mean, a lot depends upon the access that, that you have. Certainly, it's a good idea to protect the web browsing as much as possible and, and to make sure you're trying to use at least some uh, secure web browser. Uh, you know, don't use IE. Um, but, I mean, a lot depends on how much hassle it is. It's a wonderful idea to, to separate it. And certainly, if you have, uh, for, for the people that have some sort of privileged access who can change, um, you know, have the ability to change the configuration or change the, uh, the, the, uh, the authentication or whatever of the, of, of systems, uh, this is extremely important because uh, even though one thing is that when when they classify vulnerabilities for some reason, privilege escalation is classified as something. Oh well, we don't have to worry about that very much. But privilege escalation is very important in terms of a chain of attacks that uh, that can compromise your system. All they have to do is get in at the lower level, then they can escalate privileges, become a privileged user on your system, and then potentially go after sort of you know Active Directory or whatever whatever authentication system you, that you use. So anybody with those kind of privileges should definitely use some sort of a, additional thing. It may also be possible to use uh, multi-factor authentication to protect those more sensitive things and that may be a more acceptable kind of uh, kind of thing rather than actually having multiple systems um, so I'm gonna moderate and give Susan a chance to uh, to offer I'm her sure Susan, yeah, I'm sure Susan has, has some comments here <laughs> so um, when we can separate things into separate machines or virtual machines, I love it. It is not practical for everyone, especially people who are not very tech savvy. Um, and if we are going to stress someone out to the point that they make more mistakes, that's no longer helpful. However, there are two things that I will point out that can be really helpful. Um, one is there are a lot of organizations that discourage bring your own device things because they're like, oh my god, there are all these devices in the building, it's horrible. If you have bring your own device and you have a separate Wi-Fi network that doesn't connect to anything in the building, it just goes straight out to the internet, I love that. Because what happens is suddenly everyone goes to Facebook on their phone instead of on their work computer. Thank goodness. Um, and so all of the stuff that could have been on the work computer that's probably highly vulnerable and full of ads that can be attacks and stuff is not happening on the work computer. Um, so I'm actually a huge BYOD fan. Um, the other thing I'll mention is for those people who really love higher security things, um, the virtualization answer is really, really good if you're tech savvy enough to pull it off. And if you really want to play with the up and coming stuff, there's something called Cubes OS. That's Q U B E S hyphen O S dot org. That is an operating system based on running a hypervisor on your machine where basically any window in your operating system is part of some virtualized instance and you can segregate everything within one operating system install. And it's actually a really cool design. I would not advise people who are not very technical to try running it though because it is still somewhere between experimental and beta quality at this point. But it's really cool and it's an up and coming technology. 
Uh, Michael says, Susan, thank you for your take on that. I'm on the InfoSec side of the house, but trying to make sure I keep the practicality and tech comfort levels in mind. Uh, good for you, and uh, uh, you know, great ideas. And I think if you can implement them, it's it can make lives easier or harder depending on the circumstances and the workflows. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh. Um, uh, I've been keeping track of all the links and things that you guys have been referencing over here to the left and so that people that are following along can copy and, and paste them and save them for later. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Solyndra has a question. Uh, how can we make our web browsers highly secure? So. First of all, um, EFF.org puts out an extension called Privacy Badger, which is wonderful um, because instead of querying a third-party server every time you try to load something to find out if it's bad or not, which exposes a whole other set of privacy problems, it learns from your web browsing and after a few days of watching you visit websites, it figures out what's tracking you and starts blocking it. Um, which means that it is basing it on information that is local to your own machine. It's really well done. It really helps because um, the things that track you and behave badly are the more dangerous um, of the ads and things that you're going to see. It's a privacy enhancer, but it also helps with security because um, a lot of those are ill-behaved ad networks in general that you have to watch out for. Um, using a generic ad blocker or the NoScript extension to only run JavaScript on sites you really trust are commonly recommended. Um, I honestly don't usually tell novice users to run NoScript because a lot of websites break without JavaScript nowadays and knowing where to run it and where not to can be very difficult. Um, I'm, I'm not very technical, and Privacy Badger works great for me. Yeah, I love Privacy Badger. I, I try to get everybody to run that. It really doesn't take a lot of tech savvy. Um, so that's a big thing. Another thing is never install Adobe Flash unless you keep it on a separate browser that you only use for one Flash thing at a time and never log into anything important there. Um, Adobe Flash has a long history of very serious vulnerabilities, and because of its architecture, it will never get better. There's also um, from EFF HTTPS everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's another good one. Which uh, which basically looks to see if um, if the site that you're going to, even though you just typed in say a a URL or something like that, uh, will look to see if there is a an HTTPS is available, and uh, and will and will uh, direct you to, to the secure version of the website rather than the insecure. Uh, another one that I uh, use is uBlock Origin, which is uh, uh, a bit lighter weight. It, it provides a lot of protection, and uh, uh, particularly from ads, but it also is not as heavy weight as, uh, as something like NoScript. I mean, I found I used NoScript for a while and found it to be so annoying uh, that I just sort of gave up on it after a while, and uh, but I really uh, uh, like uBlock Origin. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is simply that in both Firefox and Chrome or Chromium, you can go into Settings under Media and Advanced and tell it to ask your permission before running media, which means that ads don't get to download any media to your hard drive unless so that if it's something that's like on a news site that you're interested in, you can click on it and play it, but it's not going to just download something to your hard drive without you knowing. Um, sadly, it does not prevent websites from annoyingly auto-playing streaming media in your web browser, which I wish to God it did because that's irritating. Um. Uh, one other thing is just in terms of, a, uh, of uh, reducing your attack surface, uh, there are lots of very inexpensive Chromebooks out there that can really do not provide the the level of attack surface of a uh, of a full OS, but still allow you to get an amazing amount done. I'm using a Chromebook now, and uh, it runs Skype and it's doing this uh, 
doing this presentation and uh, some of the newer Chromebooks I also allow you which may be more problematic allow you to run uh, Android uh, Android apps um, at least they do provide a, a smaller attack surface yeah and that you know going back to Michael's question Chromebooks have definitely been one of the specific solutions I've seen folks mm -hmm. use when they want to, to say look you know if you're going to go to Facebook, just mm -hmm. go through it through this $200 Chromebook. You mm -hmm. can have that thing open with you. Don't do that on, on your main desktop. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, I, and I think this is just a clarification for from Susan, what is the name of the plugin add-on that prevents automatic download of videos media? That was a so Chrome setting. That's a setting in yeah. Chrome and Firefox. You have to dig into the advanced media settings on both, but it's buried in there. Um, click around and you'll find it eventually. <laughs> cool. Um, and like I said, it does not prevent streaming things from coming through automatically, though. Um, it can be very confusing because I think it's buried in the privacy settings under content or something like uh, that. Ah, that might be it. But it's... At least on Chrome. Yeah, they, they do not want to make finding it easy, unfortunately. So we've got a few minutes left. I just want to remind people to to take to check out our survey. I have it listed here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just it's a it's just a, a few questions, and one of the questions is uh, a request for topics and presentations. So please give us some feedback and tell us if you want to hear anything uh, specific for your uh, your general area or background. And uh, let's take last call for questions. Um, and if, if people are going to be typing, uh, Craig, Susan, Bob, do you guys have any uh, last-minute uh, thoughts or comments that you'd like to make? Well, I, I'll just say that it's we, we love fielding questions. It's really uh, it's helpful to us and enjoyable to us mm -hmm. to hear about what you guys are thinking about and are concerned about. So really, thank you very much for, for your participation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we appreciate folks tuning in. Yep. Um, and actually, uh, Craig, why don't you briefly touch on the bonus material on the slideshow, just so that people know that it's there uh, when we post the archive. Oh, yeah, good point. So um, after slide, uh, after the question slide, we have a number of other slides that really go into more a little well. They go into a little more detail uh, than Bob did on the uh, the things in section four of the presentation. Um, and and I would just in, encourage folks if you if you review any parts of the slides or have questions um, that that uh, come up or that we didn't really answer well, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Reference mm -hmm. this presentation. Reference a particular slide. Whatever you want, and we'll we'll try to get back with you. Great. Have we and, dumped all three of our emails in there so they can get a hold of us? Uh, I have. I posted your email, uh, Susan, in here. I'll post okay. it just so that people can see it again. There's um, mine. And we have, yeah, and we have, uh, we have a contact form and all sorts of other ways to to get a hold of us. Uh, and just to go over business for next month. Our next webinar is March 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and our topic is SCN and IAM integration at Duke University, and our speaker is Charlie Nafel. And um, with that, I just want to say thank you, everyone, so much for joining our presentation. Thank you, Craig, Susan, and Bob for agreeing to present. And uh, I'll be ringing off momentarily. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye.